Every year, right before the Lent season begins, New Orleans celebrates what they call Mardi Gras. This is one of the most popular attractions in the city of New Orleans every year. And most people are under the assumption that this celebration has its roots in Christianity. But like most things in our world, nothing could be further from the truth. But before we go any further, you know what to do. Please hit that subscribe button and give us a like. As always, a very, very big thank you to all of our producers on this channel and our Patreons. Without your support, we could not do what we do. If you would like to join our Patreon community, there is a link down in the description box below. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta. My name is Bryce and today on part one on our deep dive into Mardi Gras, we're going to be talking about the celebration of Dionysus. New Orleans is a very special, special town with lots of interesting quirks and fascinating cultural activity. For example, did you know that in some of the older buildings in New Orleans, you can still see what they call Romeo spikes? These are spikes that come out of the railing to try to deter young men from sneaking into young girls' bedrooms. Or for example, there was at one point in New Orleans when people would leave a funeral, they would leave in all different directions as to confuse the spirits. And with a city that's so colorful in its eclectic culture, Mardi Gras is definitely the top of the list. Now there's so much to Mardi Gras that I am going to have to divide this video into two parts. Of course today we're going to talk about the origins of Mardi Gras, where it comes from, how it ended up in New Orleans, and then our, our part two, we're going to get into the more basic questions like why is there a baby in the king cake? But in order to understand, fully understand any story, we have to always go back to the beginning. Now Mardi Gras translates into Fat Tuesday, and this is typically the Tuesday right before the Lent season begins. Now New Orleans is a very Catholic city. Where I live in the South, it's predominantly Protestant. And as Protestants, we don't celebrate. Well, I should say, most Protestants don't celebrate Lent. However, from what I gather, the basic understanding for most people out there of Mardi Gras is that it's like one big party for you to get out all your vices before you have to go on this long journey of giving up stuff again for Lent. It's like that one last hurrah before you start your diet on Monday. Mardi Gras is full of parties, parades, drunkenness, wonderful food, and great music. Those who are familiar with Brazil, this is like the carnival of Brazil. It's pretty much under the same history and same guise. And I want to apologize if you hear trucks outside. I do live in the middle of the city and unfortunately there's not a whole lot that I can do about that noise, so I apologize. Now Mardi Gras came into the United States with our dear friends Pierre and Jean-Baptiste de Benville. Don't know if I'm saying that right, but we did talk about them in our first episode on this series of New Orleans. They were two brothers who were from French Govern Canada. And again, they came down into the Gulf of Mexico to claim some territory for the French royal court that was under the House of Bourbon at this time. Again, this was Louis XIV and all those shenanigans that we definitely did a deep dive in many, many weeks ago or months ago on this channel. I will link those videos down in the description box below. At this point, the areas that the brothers claimed for France are now modern day parts of Alabama, Mississippi, and of course, Louisiana. Louisiana, in fact, gets its name from King Louis, the territory of King Louis, again, Louis XIV, who was the monarch at that time. The three ports, as we said last week, were what we now know as Mobile, Alabama, Biloxi, Mississippi, and of course, New Orleans. On the 3rd of March of 1699, they landed at a particular place about 60 miles south of what is now New Orleans, 
and Bienville decided to call it the Pointe du Mardi Gras. This was an homage of the date, because you see, it was the date of Mardi Gras, the eve of the Lent season. And of course, Mardi Gras is not an American celebration, but does come from Europe. And as I said in the opening, it started long before the birth of Christ, which we're going to get into. In 1702, Bienville founded the Fort Louis de la Louisiana. This, again, as we know it today, is Mobile, Alabama. This was the first capital of the French territory of the New World. And in 1703, a year later, the few settlers that were there decided that they were going to carry on with the Catholic tradition of celebrating Mardi Gras or Fat Tuesday. In 1711, they formed their own crew or secret society called the Boeuf Grass Society. Now, my French is terrible, but that basically means the society of the fat cow. Now, we're going to take a deeper look into these like crews or mystical secret societies in our part two. But just for today, know that a lot of these society balls, a lot of these shenanigans that go around Mardi Gras are put on by these crews, K-R-E-W-E. And in today, in New Orleans, there are about 78 different crews. But the first one here in America was technically 1711 in Mobile, Alabama. Now, they used this fattened cow or fattened ox or whatever type of mammal you want to use because it was a symbol of the last meat that was to be eaten before it was given up for Lent. They would parade this bull or ox around town with ornate jewels on it and then slaughter it and then feed people with it. Even today in New Orleans, you can see parades with a paper mache cow or bull or ox. And this right here is where we get into the true origins of the celebration of New Orleans. Because this actually ties into the Saturnalian religions. And we've done a whole deep dive on the Saturnalian organizations and groups. I'll place that video down in the links below. But on the spring equinox, which is close to the time we celebrate Mardi Gras today, the Druids would also parade around an ox and then sacrifice the ox and bathe themselves in the blood of the ox in order to cleanse or atone for their sins. Sounds a little familiar to some concepts of Christianity, doesn't it? It also sounds super familiar to the Mithraic religion that Constantine the Great practiced, which again, I will put that link down in the description box below. We also see throughout the Bible where people worship this idea of a golden calf. After all, Baal, or as how many people say it, Baal, is that of a golden calf or a cow, the worship of a false idol. But the story goes much deeper than that. In 1985, a mystic society, a crew society, was formed called the Crew of Dionysus. Well, why would they pick Dionysus? This goes back to the true meaning of Mardi Gras. So who was Dionysus? Dionysus was considered to be the god of wine and fertility. Dionysus also had a dual nature. He was both really, really good and really, really bad. He was also the god of inspired madness. And if you've ever been to a Mardi Gras celebration, you can definitely say it is inspired madness, a controlled type of chaos. Now, a lot of people have sent me very, very mean emails and hateful emails because I keep bringing up the fact that the idea of a virgin birth, like they told us Jesus has, is actually a satanic idea. In our series over on the Dark Outpost that we do on Wednesdays on this channel, we've been reading through a lot of the missing or banned books of the gospel, books that were banned by Constantine, who again was a satanic Mithraic Roman emperor who really screwed up the Christian faith. On purpose, again, inspired madness, right? Well, in a lot of these missing or banned books, it is pretty clear that Jesus' father was Joseph, that, he, that the angel of the Lord came to Joseph as well and told Joseph to go to Mary and have a child. As I've said many times, for me and my faith, it doesn't change anything because God can work miracles wherever God wants to work miracles. I can't stand when people put boundaries on God because some preacher told them so. No, 
we are mere mortals. God is God. He can do whatever he wants to do. He can create his own son in a biological body, 100% biological body of a human being because the natural body and the soul that controls the body are two different things. Well, Dionysus, again, remember, virgin birth, God and woman, satanic. Dionysus' parents were Zeus, a god, and a mortal woman. In fact, there's a very graphic, graphic retelling of how his mother got pregnant, where she couldn't even see the spirit that she was making a baby with, for lack of a better word, but could feel it. And thus, Dionysus was born. He, for the Canaanites, is the god of rebirth and, again, is the god of a greater purpose because he has all this power as half-mortal, half-god, if you will. And during the Roman Empire, they would have the festival of Dionysus in the springtime. Way before Jesus was even born, they were celebrating Dionysus. Dionysus is also called the god of revelry, and people who go to New Orleans to celebrate Mardi Gras are called revelers. Now, interestingly enough, and yet another reason why they took away so many of the books of the Bible, all of this is explained in the Bible. If you look at artwork that depicts Dionysus, there's something very, very interesting about him. It seems that Dionysus is a giant. And we know that giants did exist before the Nephilim, we know from reading the Apocalypse of Abraham that Adam and Eve were both considered to be giants, and people also believe that possibly Noah himself was a giant. But we have a certain group of giants that emerged called the Nephilim. Now, one of the books taken out of the Bible was the Book of Enoch. We see references to the Nephilim here and there in the canonized Bible, but not really enough for people to really understand what happened. God sent certain angels down to the earth to teach man how to work with nature, to teach man how to heal himself, how to read the stars, how to do all these things to survive on this planet. But some of these watchers defied God and became what we call fallen angels. They defied God because they decided that they thought that the human women, the daughters of men, were gorgeous. And so they wanted to take these women as their wives. Now, many people believe that it, at this time in our world, we were more technologically advanced than we are now. We weren't just, you know, desert people walking around pitching up tents. We might have had things even more sophisticated than YouTube or cell phones. Who knows? And this was because of the watchers, especially the fallen angels giving human beings too much information. And these watchers who mated with human women had what we now call Nephilim. These Nephilim were, yes, giants, but their spirits were the spirits of fallen angels. So not all the giants were Nephilim, but all the Nephilim were giants. And Dionysus' story fits that of a Nephilim. His mother mated with a fallen angel, creating Dionysus, the god of revelry, the god of inspired madness, the god of wine, of substance, the dual nature of good and bad and of chaos. Now, we know that the Nephilim spirits, the spirits, the soul within these giants, are now what we call demons. So, because of these, the madness of these Nephilims, that is when God created the flood to wipe them out and told Noah, who allegedly also was a giant, a good one, to build his ark, bring his people on so he could just clean everything, a clean slate. It was just too diabolical. When the bodies of these Nephilim died because of drowning, their spirits left their body. That's what happens, at least if you're a person of faith, of any faith, you believe that your spirit your soul, your eternal whatever you believe, will then leave the body. Well, the spirits were so wicked that they became demons, a legion of Yeldabaoth or Lucifer, Satan, whatever you want to call the head fallen angel. And so after Dionysus had died, his spirit was then released to walk the earth as a demon. Now, if you remember from the book of Jubilee, there was a conversation where God had with with some of his people and Lucifer who was called the Prince Mestima in the book of Jubilee where God basically 
pulls back 90% of these demons. It only allows like 10% of them to roam the earth. This is an agreement with Lucifer because in this timeline, human beings have to have free will to choose which God they serve. Are they going to serve Lucifer? Or are they going to serve God? Now in the apocalypse of Abraham, we know that Joel, one of the arch angels was responsible for holding back these demons and in the last days he will let these demons loose before we switch into the a thousand years of peace which i believe is what we're seeing now and why the world is so hectic right now well it appears that dionysus was one of these nephilim spirits that was left to roam the world now we know that these luciferians these satanic people have to participate in in order to give their gods life. God, our God, and the archangels, the beings that are worshiping the light, light positivity can create itself. It can create life. It can give that divine spark because a spark is light. However, Lucifer, Dionysus, all these demons cannot create anything. The only way for them to sustain their power is to take. That's why we have this idea of vampirism, this taking of a life force. Sometimes very, very, very literal and sometimes more psychic or spiritual. And so the basis of Mardi Gras is bringing energy to the demon of Dionysus. And again, the church, especially the Catholic church, since it was the original church, the powers that be have done a really good job manipulating Jesus' story to mirror that of a satanic story. And once we read the true story of Jesus in these missing or banned books, we see it even more clearly. For many people who are of the Christian faith, when they start learning this stuff, it scares them and they think, oh my God, my, my religion must be wrong. No, 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 your religion isn't wrong. You've just been fed false information. We know now that the organization that we call the church is owned by the cabal. It's still owned by Satanists. So this whole celebration of Mardi Gras was supposed to give life to Dionysus, to bring that demon the energy he needs to wreak havoc on our world. I've said this before with our Christmas celebrations and Halloween and all these other celebrations that are have the basis in satanic practices. I truly, truly, truly believe in the power of intentional choice. And I am not someone that's going to tell you to never go and celebrate Mardi Gras. If you're celebrating Mardi Gras because you want to have fun with people you love, you want to celebrate with your friends and family, you want to dance, eat good food, and be in a state of love with those you care about, then I don't think that's a problem, in my opinion. Especially if your heart and your soul belongs to God. All that generated energy from doing those things with people you love with pure intention is going to go to God because that's where your intention lies. However, if you're wicked and you understand Dionysus, you're going to be participating in this festival to give power to this demon. So again, do I believe that you need to stop celebrating Mardi Gras because of its roots? No, absolutely not. It doesn't work that way. Everybody has personal choice and free will, and it's your heart that's going to dictate your actions. If you're not, if you're going to Mardi Gras and you're not hurting people and you're just having fun, then no foul, no harm. It's the same thing with Halloween. Even though that we know that Halloween is inherently satanic, I see nothing wrong with allowing children to dress up and go trick-or-treating. It's fun, it's loving, and God is present. Same with Christmas. Even though Christmas was a Saturnalian festival that had nothing to do with Jesus because Jesus wasn't even born then, I still think you can celebrate Christmas in love and joy and be in the light of God and not in the satanic path. The days, the stars, the seasons were all created by God anyway. And so if you are a Christian or you don't want to participate in something like giving life to Dionysus, then reclaim Mardi Gras back. Reclaim it back for yourself and for the light. I hope that makes sense. Again, I'm not a fundamentalist. I don't believe that fundamentalism in any religion is a good thing. I actually think the deeper and the far you get into fundamentalism in any religion, especially Christianity, you, you turn more wicked and more satanic. And people who have wicked hearts anyway are going to do wicked things. 
So that is the basis, the beginning of Mardi Gras, was the celebration of Dionysus. That's a lot I know to take in. And so the next episode, we're going to dive deeper into the other quirks of Mardi Gras. We're going to talk about why there's a baby in the king cake. We're going to talk about those beads they throw out at the parades. And we're also going to talk about the Mardi Gras colors, green, purple, and yellow, as well as all those crews or secret societies based around this celebration. All right, guys, I hope that you're having a wonderful, wonderful day. Please leave me your thoughts and opinions down in the comment section below. Let me know if you've been to Mardi Gras and what your experience was. I'll tell you guys something. When I was researching, I've been researching this for such a long time. That's why we're having to do two parts because there's just so much information. But I sat down and I watched some parades with some high schools in New Orleans uh, for Mardi Gras and the bands, the marching bands going down the streets and stuff. And it, it was before 2020, it was like 2019 or something, so it was before lockdown. And I got emotional watching these high school bands in this Mardi Gras parade because all of these young kids were like smiling at each other and like dancing. And it just, they just all seemed so, so, so happy. And that is a part of their heritage and a part of their culture to celebrate this, this holiday. And I, I literally was sitting back here like sobbing as I was watching these YouTube videos of these parades because the kids just look so happy and all the faces were open and free and and the smiles and I just thought that you know God is present like even if this started off as something nefarious God is present in the smile of these children's faces as they play their music with their friends and they they participate in something that's such and something that's so ingrained into their culture and their life and so even though again this might have started off as something pretty bad, we have the power to make it something good. All right, guys, thank you so much to Josh McKay for doing our music. If you would like to purchase the opening song, there is a link down in the description box below. And thank you, as always, to Todd Broderick for helping me get this video out to you guys today. Thank you for being here. I love each and every one of you, and I will talk to you soon. Bye.